think we have maybe uh, several new people from last week when I spoke. Uh, so just to repeat briefly, I've been a medical social worker for about 45 years oh. and I've worked with um, oh, hospitals. Could, could we all mute please for now, thanks. Um, so I've worked in hospitals and clinics and with home care agencies. I uh, owned my own uh, placement agency for caregivers for the home for almost 20 years. And I was 10 years um, a volunteer with Compassion and Choices, which is a great source for end of life information. And I'll be referring to them many times today. Um, so, oh, and I also was a hospice volunteer with um, Hospice of the East Bay for a while. Um, so, getting on to the, our favorite subject, uh, or one that should be one of our main subjects, given our ages. I hate to say it, but we're getting closer, guys. <laughs> um, so medical care in the USA today is both extensive and expensive. We uh, are probably, we are the most expensive medical care system in the world, but we don't actually get the best results, which is interesting. I think sometimes we get a little bit over involved with our technology. Um, did everyone see the cartoon that got sent out? The doctor talking to a patient, he says, you've got six months left, but with aggressive treatment, we can make it seem much longer. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, high-tech medical care can bring unnecessary suffering. And although nine out of 10 people are confident they will receive the type of medical treatment they want at the end of the life, many of them don't. I'd like everyone to close their eyes for a minute. And I'm asking you to think about what is important to your quality of life? What is something that if it disappeared from your life, you would feel that your quality of life had diminished. Close your eyes, think for a minute. Let's check in. What, what, what did you come up with? Speak out, unmute, speak out. I said mobility. Mobility. I said eyesight. Okay. I said, I said not losing my mind. Yeah. So does that involve being in charge with your For art? me, yes. <laughs> with, it, with your <laughs> mind. <laughs> Margaret? Um, I'm, I don't know. I was thinking of, of not being able to use my car. Yeah. Okay. I would say un unrelenting pain. Yes. Mm. Anyone else? Uh, ability to care for myself. I don't want anyone caring for me. Okay. <laughs> Donna, Gun, yeah, Janice. Not being able to communicate with family. Okay. Janice, you're muted. Janice, you're muted. Okay, here I am. <laughs> I, uh, I would hate to lose my car because it's independence to me. So independence is a big thing for me and being able to take care of myself. Yes. How about, how about being hooked up to machines? Is that okay? Oh, yeah, I didn't even thought about that. That's even more horrible. <laughs> then you lose your independence. So... <laughs> Yes. What about having someone feed you? Nourishment. <clears throat> what about if you couldn't take it yourself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so part of the way 
that we could stay in charge is to hold on to that idea of those things that are important and let that infuse your conversations with your doctor. And for those of you who weren't with us last week, we talked uh, a little bit about how to speak with your doctor and the fact that your doctor can provide you the best care, probably related to the direct and the most extensive questions that you can ask. Uh, like what are the side effects of this medicine that you're, you're um, prescribing for me? Um, how long do I have to live? That's a good one because if you can ask that question of your doctor when you get a diagnosis of a serious disease, basically your doctor knows that you can handle the straight story. We asked, we made a homework assignment last week and that was to think about the way you would like to die. How would you like your last days to look? Um, so can we, can we talk about that now? What did you come up with for things that were important to you in the way that you died? I would like to die the way I helped my mom die. I don't know if she liked it or not, but uh, my dad and I were with her and I played music, soft music, and we stroked her and told her to go into the light. Wonderful. What about anyone else? You were not thinking about your death <laughs> come on guys it's gonna happen it's oh. gonna happen we're not getting out of here alive hey barbara i've always i always joke that i mean I'll, i'm prepared i've paid past lacqua i've got my sight and got my trust and all that and i've always joked that it's going to be a birdie putt on the 18th hole bolt of lightning smile <laughs> still on my face <laughs> Hey, I'm with you. I like I, that one. I know you are. Uh, <laughs> very good. All I, right. noticed, I noticed you said the 18th hole, so you you had a good game. Oh, absolutely. Birdie yeah, putt, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, back, back to realities here. Well, I thought I helped my mom die the way she wanted to, but I think she died. She In the end, she died the way she wanted to. Because she was, we she would not sign an advance directive. She said, "I will tell you when it's time." Well, when I was, was standing lucky. there, she told the nurse was, and said, "Hey, I'm not having take this feeding tube out. I'm ready to go." She could. Uh, she's lucky that she was still there cognitively to be yeah, able to say and, that. And prior to that, she had not been. You know, she'd been a little bit out of it, and so we had music. She liked music, and we all came and sang around her. And she got annoyed. She said. What is that noise? Just make that noise stop. <laughs> <laughs> so Gail, can we assume can we assume I, that's the way you want to die? I thought I would do something similar with my dad. My dad kept wanting to go outside. He wanted to see the birds. And he was in a room at that point where there were geese flying all around the hospital. It wasn't vultures, it was geese. And um he he said the the nurse said well, we're going to change the sheet so why don't you guys go down and eat and he died while we were gone and my mother died while i was gone that's a frequent story <laughs> so gail so gail so, i don't so i don't know i i would like to, when you initially said what is it you want i want to live, die at home i don't want to be in the hospital i would prefer to die outside yeah unless it's pretty pretty cold. You know, if it's great like today, I'd like to die outside. Great. And with Any my family with me, unless they don't want to be here. Because Good. Anyone else? Someone else. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Lois. Was that you? Who said, okay, I'll go? Oh, Donna. Donna. Hi. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I hadn't thought of the lightning thing, but that's really kind of a good idea because I've almost been hit twice by lightning. Very, very close. 
So mm. uh, that would work for me. And I'm hoping that I just drop dead. I've said that all my life. One of my best friends died that way, making herself a drink, walking back to her couch and, and she was gone. And I'm hoping to have that grace and I have all my stuff in order and have for a couple of years now where I'm not, I, I don't dwell on it. I'm not worried about it. it when it happens, somebody I know died walking his dog on first street here in town. Mm -hmm. That's nice. I, maybe I'll be out feeding my hummingbirds. I can't plan it. And I, I just don't dwell on it. It's, it is going to happen, but um, so far 81 almost next week. Um, so you know what? I'm hoping for 90 and I just go on with an attitude like I just want to live. I want to see my grandson graduate from high school. And that's it. That's it. I'm just not gonna think about how when because I will have no choice. Yes, you but will have lightning, choice. Oh, after after our conversation today, you will see that you have choices. Yeah, well, I know as far as how you're cared for. You don't have um, a choice on how you're gonna die. I always say. yes you do yes you will that's what I'm here to tell you about today okay okay I always, I always anyone get, else I'd get Mimi. Killed, I'd get killed by uh, uh, by a milk truck because we used to have a milk <laughs> truck that came down our lane and Herb the milk, milkman would bring the milk up so I was all set to get hit by a milk truck and I haven't seen a milk truck in so long <laughs> I mean, you're never gonna die okay so I'm what would your other choices happen. be? <laughs> oh, I'm, Maybe. I'm, Your I'm, other I'm, choices. I'm just walking off the golf course, having a wonderful time with my dear friend. Uh, but maybe already, maybe finishing a, a, a nice, uh, we used to call them bootlegs. It's a minty <laughs> drink that that's kind of like lemonade and, and full of uh, chopped up mint. And that was a terrific after golf drink. And maybe I should finish that too. <laughs> I can see I may I may should have asked this question in a different way. <laughs> carrying carrying on, um, I, I I can see that all of you have decided how you're going to die. It doesn't involve you know the medical system or or lack thereof. Um, so let's reiterate again: Is there anyone who does not have their advanced healthcare directive done? Janet, Janice, if you want to stay in charge of things until it's the moment of death, I suggest that you definitely have your advanced health care directive. Um, also, choosing who has your power of attorney is really important. And a lot of times it's not going to be your children because they might have the most difficulty in letting you go. Compassion and Choices has uh, a form called the Healthcare Decisions Game, and it's quiz for family physician or healthcare agent. And it's a little quiz you can give to anyone that you might be thinking of being your power of attorney, because it'll it'll quickly it's five questions and it'll quickly show you if that person is actually go going to be able you know, to function as... What uh, is the name of that again, please? Healthcare De Decisions Game. Thank you. And it's just, it's five questions. And if your potential person for power of attorney doesn't answer them correctly, you know they're probably not a good person to select. Okay. Um, for sure, have conversations with your kids about how you want to die, how you envision your dying. And I suggest that the more often you raise the conversation, the more comfortable they will get with it. The idea of you're dying, you are going to die. And the idea that you have druthers, you have preferences about the way that that, the way that, that happens. And as we heard in our first lecture, you want to make the file to make it easier for your kids to take over after you go. Um, the file should have, you know, doctors, your attorney, your advanced healthcare directive, information about the hospital, a list of all your personal accounts, and in this day and age, 
a list of your passwords. <laughs> <laughs> and so, put it somewhere, it's called an end of life file and put it somewhere where your kids know it is and have everything in it that you can imagine that they would want to know. Uh, what do you have, Gail? I bought this big file box Bail. and wrote on the top of it, end of life. Great. And it will have, all, it doesn't have anything in it yet. I thought I'd do my taxes first and then put all this stuff in <laughs> <my> <laughs> So here's where we talk about choices. Janice, listen carefully. Okay. Um, number one, the first choice that you have is to, to take on all treatment interventions possible. And the good news is if you want to have everything done for you, you don't have to do anything because that's the way it'll play out. Uh, doctors frequently are going to try to keep you alive until the last possible moment. And the unfortunate side of that can be sometimes that can be, um, can be painful, like um, cancer patients going through as much chemotherapy as possible can be a long, fairly miserable process. But to make sure that you live absolutely as long as you possibly can, you can take on all the treatment options offered. Another choice you have is to refuse treatment, avoid unwanted medical treatment. The, uh, the US Supreme Court has actually affirmed people's right to end their own lives by refusing treatment offered by a doctor or a hospital. Every adult has the right to refuse unwanted medical treatment. <laughs> um, everybody has the right to choose what will be done to his or her own body. Get the care you want. Uh, and in that, in that regard, a, someone who shares your power of attorney or is your personal advocate can be helpful to you in being with you when you say to your doctor or to the hospital, I don't want that treatment. The third choice you have is hospice or palliative care. Palliative care is comfort care and symptom, symptom management to reduce pain and suffering while you're still participating in treatment. Hospice care is when you have decided that you don't want any more treatment and it is palliative care in addition to a team of support, social worker, um, volunteers, all kinds of visitors. Uh, although I understand that palliative care is now also offered in the context of a team that provides a number of those team members that hospice does as well. Um, but again, you're still, you're still taking treatment. Is somebody making a comment? Another choice that you have is what called V said voluntary stopping of eating and drinking. Um, this, and this option is open to anyone at any time and is, Ill, and is illegal in all of the states. Basically, you just simply stop eating any food, stop taking any liquids. It sounds sort of ghastly to those of us who've never even survived a diet, but the truth is that it can be quite a peaceful way to die. It does take the commitment of not only yourself, but your family, because somebody will need to be with you. Basically, um, you can also have the supervision of hospice or a palliative care team if they agree to it. Uh, and that is a way in which 
hospices should be interviewed so that you know that if if VSED is an option, you might want to consider that they would be willing to work with you on that. Um, you can interview hospices and also you can change the nurses that come with the hospice. Uh, you can also change how they are handling you. So uh, most of the times a doctor will recommend a hospice to you, but that does not have to be your only choice. Barbara, how long does it ta that process take if you ended your eating and drinking? I'm, I'm getting there. Oh, okay. So it's um, frequently um, being very sleepy and sleeping a lot happens quite quickly. And it's in three to six days, the person will enter a coma, which is you know, perpetual sleep and not waking up again. Uh, it says on the page that I'm following six to 14 days average to death. But in my experience, people rarely last longer than nine days. Um, I have seen a woman who was, uh, she was a doctor's wife actually, and she was suffering from increasing uh, dementia she decided that she wasn't going to wait to get really gaga. And so she picked a date for herself and the family knew that one daughter was willing to be with her and she chose to be said. For three days after she stopped eating and drinking, she continued doing her usual daily walks. And then quite quickly, she took to her bed and fell asleep and just didn't wake up again. If people with dementia have thought of this as an alternative before they became not able to make a, a, a rational decision, um, basically they can be reminded that they wanted to do this at the end of their life so as not to prolong the dementia or the Alzheimer's suffering they can, and they go, oh, I'm hungry, I want to eat. They can often be gently reminded that they made a promise to stop eating and drinking and be, you know, sort of coaxed back into the program. It, of course, if they don't, then the whole thing would stop and they're not able to do that. One of the, uh, there was a woman with colon cancer and I was in touch with her husband and she knew that she wanted to be said when she got to the point where she didn't want to go on. And they talked to me about it. And then basically they were okay on their own. Some days later, I called them because I knew she'd set a date. I called him and spoke with him. And he was obviously feeling as though he had had a very uh, significant experience, life experience. And he said, Barbara, it was the most peaceful, the most beautiful death that I can imagine. She went very, very peacefully and easily. And it was such a blessing to me. So I've never forgotten his words um, mm. because that was what really, really worked for them. The last alternative that one has is medical aid in dying. California has had a right to die law since 2015. And I'm going to define for you um, what is medical aid in dying. It is a safe and trusted medical practice in which a terminally ill, mentally capable person with a prognosis of six months or less to live, has the option to request from their doctor a prescription for medication, which they can choose to self-ingest to end unbearable suffering and die peacefully. This is, uh, this law, this kind of medical aid in dying has long time been available in Holland and Switzerland and Belgium. Washington and Oregon have had a right to die law since the 90s, California since 2015, 
And as of now, there are 11 states that have medical aid in dying. By the way, something I forgot to mention on VSED, once someone has started to not eat or drink, they, can, they would become hospice eligible. So then you could have the support of hospice, the hospice team during the days of dying if you wanted it. Um, I'll give you the highlights, the, the parts of the California Con Compassionate Choices Act. Um, the person must be terminally, a terminally ill adult that is over 18 with six months or less to live. Patient must be a resident of California and make an informed decision, which means that the doctor must inform them of their diagnosis, their prognosis, the potential risks associated with taking the medication, the probable results, and provide in writing any feasible alternatives, including palliative and hospice care. Um, in California, we have what is called a, a right to know law. So anybody that doesn't offer alternatives to somebody can be in serious trouble. The patient cannot be coerced by a next of kin or any third party. And the way that that's guaranteed is that the doctor at some point must meet alone with the patient with no one else there beside them so that they would be guaranteed the freedom to speak. The patient must be evaluated by two physicians. The first step is an oral request from a doctor to a doctor. And then two weeks later, another oral request and a written request, which means that the process usually takes 15 days. There also needs to be a consulting physician who would corroborate the first physician's diagnosis. The patient must be mentally capable. And if there has been any history of um, confusion or of um, a mental illness, then the referring doctor should actually make a referral to a mental health specialist. There are two waiting periods, 15 days after the first oral request, before the written request, and then 48 hours after the second oral request and the written request before the prescription is actually written. The person can stop this process anytime. It's like chicken out. Okay, I've decided I'm not going to do that. Uh, right up until the last. And then even if the person picks up the prescription for the life-ending medications, they can decide not to take it. They simply could have it in their hands and decide not to go through with it. The person must take the prescription themselves. They must have the physical and the mental ability to actually give themselves the medication. The medication um, in with different uh, medical care systems or different doctors is a different combination of drugs, um, but they are they're sedatives. And one of the ones that is frequently used is Elabil, which is an old, old um, antidepressant. Um, the medicine generally comes in a pill form. And so it needs to be, it needs to be broken up in a mortar and pestle and made a, um, a powder and with the powder, maybe a half a cup of, we used to suggest um, a half a cup of orange juice or apple cider, followed by um, a quick spoonful of sherbet to take the taste out of your mouth. 
um, the act, the process of the act of medical aid in dying has to be honored or people can be prosecuted for not following the instructions. And then both physicians must write detailed reports to the Department of Health Services. Does anybody have any questions so far? Good. Judy? Um, it sounds like, um, let's see, it sounds like it, there are hurdles, like, um, and I'm wondering if there are, what the percentage of people, I don't expect you to answer this, who choose this path and are not able to pursue it. What about in, in Oregon and, uh, I mean, they've been in existence longer. You ever heard of that? Is my perception off base that it looks like, you know, there would be hurdles that if I was interested, I couldn't do it. I mean, I couldn't do it because I have Parkinson's disease and that's not a terminal illness. Well, I think it depends on a doctor. Oh, that's true. It depends on a doctor saying that. Um, I, the, the hurdle is the time, Judy. And recently, uh, I think just this last summer, the law was extended. It was, it was only to go to, I think, 224 or 2024. It's been extended to 2031. And also what's been oh. added is if a doctor says, decides that this person who's asking for help in using medical aid and dying, if it looks like they have less than two weeks left to live, it takes two days. Uh -huh. So the hurdles okay. have been lowered. And um, <laughs> it's, they're not really hurdles as much as just the steps that you must go through. Yeah. So in my mind, the the um, hint from that is that don't you know don't don't leave something like this to the last minute. Give yourself. I mean, don't wait until you're in excruciating pain and you can hardly breathe, and you know that you really yeah. are actively dying, um, so that you do have the couple of weeks yeah. to do that. And um, so there's two oral requests and one written request, but the last the the last oral request and the written request can be the yeah. same day. Okay. Sally so, something. Oh, and any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I have a question. I have a comment actually. Um, with another potential hurdle, um, my brother had a friend who had ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease and he had decided that he would never go on a ventilator and that he would want to die before that became inevitable. And so he was all set up, you know, to do this, the medically assisted dying, but he was living in a nursing home because he had no family except one sister. And what happened was his sister agreed to take him home the day before he was going to take this medication. Mm -hmm. And so he died at her house. But if mm -hmm. someone didn't have that option, you know, I don't know if there's any other alternatives to that, but I believe that if, if you're in any kind of a, um, a nursing facility or boarding care or anything that they, they are not allowed to do it on their premises. Well, they are not doing it. I mean, the patient's True. doing it. But the, but the but, nursing but it, home it, would not uh, let him do it there. Right, right. So. And that's when we worked with patients when I was a volunteer with Compassion and Choices. That's mm -hmm. exactly what we did. And vol there are volunteers still who work with Compassion and Choices. And so if somebody were in that situation, they're in a nursing home, they know they're ready to end their lives and they don't have family to go to, mm -hmm. Compassion and Choices volunteers can often be asked and they'll, they'll, they'll go to a location, like one of the patients that we did, went to a motel with the okay. volunteer. And then, and also if hospice is there again, whether the hospice is willing to attend such a death, some are, some aren't, but the hospice nurse could also be available 
but not be the critical primary one, probably in most cases, they would need to have the volunteer. But okay. yeah. Anyone else, Do Donna? Yeah. Uh, what would the death certificate show if you chose that way? It would show the underlying diagnosis. Okay. It would, you know, it would say you died of cancer because basically you have to be in effect hospice eligible. You don't have to necessarily, well, yeah. Basically to use the law, you probably need to be a hospice patient. I think not technically, but probably 90% of cases are hospice. Right. And so hospice, the hospice nurse then writes the death certificate and puts down the underlying disease that has made them terminally ill. That's technically why it's not technically called suicide and why, uh, especially Compassion and Choices, really hates to hear of it being called assisted suicide because it's not as though that person had an option to live. They don't already. Go ahead. One, yeah, one thing, the hospice nurse never signs the death certificate. It is always the doctor. The hospice nurses, yeah. we are uh, licensed to pronounce death. But I think, we, yeah. <clears throat> thanks we for do, the clarification, yeah. yeah. We do not sign it, it's always the doctor of record. And the cost is always the hospice diagnosis. And the, the doctor is usually the hospice doctor. No, it is because now every hospice, of course, has a medical director. Yeah. But it is the patient's regular doctor. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Usually it's the one that refers the patient to hospice. So it can be whatever kind of doctor the patient has, but uh -huh. that would be the, the doctor on record mm -hmm. that will sign the death certificate. And yes, we do know the cause of death before they die. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. uh-huh. Okay, so um, mm -hmm. I don't see any other hands. Uh, the good news is uh, if you're Kaiser, it's very, very easy to access medical aid in dying. You yeah. ask your doctor, and if your doctor is not one of those who wants to write a prescription, they will find you another Kaiser doctor who will write the prescription for you. You'll have a social worker advocate assigned to you, and they will be your partner on the path to your death. The, they will assign you the consulting doctor, and um, basically, I was at a home in Marin when there was a home visit made by the Kaiser pharmacist who carried with him, there were two of the pharmacists that came, they carried the medication with them and sat for several hours with the patient talking about how you take the medicine and um, you know, just asking for all kinds of questions. They, they were not there to just make a delivery and go. They were there actually to, to make this referral of the meditation to the patient with great care and understanding. And, and it was quite impre impressive to watch. Um, so again, with Kaiser, it is again, again the two weeks from request to receiving the medications unless you are so close to death that they can use the law, speeding it up to a couple of days if the Kaiser system is able to do that. Mm -hmm. The bad news is if you are not Kaiser, you need to find a doctor. And I would encourage all of you to ask your doctor if they would be willing to write a prescription uh, with, under the medical aid and dying law, um, even if you're Kaiser, because uh, it's good to know 
if you've got a doctor who's going to be able to do it for you or whether you might make extra time because that doctor will need to find another doctor. I don't expect that takes long in the Kaiser system, but it might mean another appointment. If you're not Kaiser, I, I went online to try and look for a list of doctors who are willing to write prescriptions for medical aid in dying, and it doesn't exist. Again, Compassion and Choices would be your resource for finding out where there is a doctor locally who is willing to write to see you and to write a prescription for medical aid in dying. The doctors have um, the, the um, number of people who are using medical aid in dying has gone up every year. Where do I, in uh, 2018, 337 people used the law. In 2019, 405 people. And in 2019, um, 2020, 435 people. So there, there remains, I believe, a stigma around uh, accessing the law, talking about the law. Many people are not aware that we have such a law in California. Many others think it's sort of terrible that you're not toughing it out to the end. Um, the, um, this, there's also a stigma for the doctors. You know, they take the, the oath of office saying first do no harm. And for many doctors, helping to cause the end of a person's life is doing harm. So getting doctors on board with the law is actually a, a cultural change that needs to happen with the profession of medicine. Um, so it's, it's coming along. And I think that probably it will be more and more available like I say, I think compassion and choices can be your uh, resource for, for help in finding a doctor because their volunteers have worked with people who are using the law before. And so they would know who are the doctors. Just some more information about the law. Wills and contracts, insurance and annuity policies are not affected. Um, Let's see. Yes, the, we already said the death is resulting from the the underlying medically ill, med, um, the underlying cause of death that's already been diagnosed. Um, that's oh, so one other thing is that I would like to speak about. There is a form called a pulse, and I'm going to show it, show one to you. It looks like this. It's called a post, and it's another way of staying in charge of things. Um, I, in an earlier, um, in an earlier session with our end of life seminar here, uh, it was advised that everybody get their post. And I, I'm going to give you here a personal opinion that has been formed through work with a post. My belief is that a post is not appropriate unless you have been diagnosed with a terminal illness. It's meant to be hung on your refrigerator and 911 EMTs will come rushing into your house and look for it on your fridge. And if you have, if you have said that you don't want any, you do not want to have resuscitation attempted, they will not. And if you do want resuscitation, well, you're going to get that without a pulse, a pulse hanging on your fridge. I heard a story of a woman who, um, she actually gave lectures on using, filling out and using a pulse. So she had her pulse already and it was posted on her fridge. And then she uh, had an appointment for a, um, a colonoscopy 
and you have to be you have to be put under for a colonoscopy. She had to go and rescind her post before she could have the colonoscopy done because if she had if something had happened to her under the colonoscopy, if she had a post active, basically they could not resuscitate her if that's what she had suggested. So I say there is a time when it is too early to have a post. Um, I, 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 I think that just another plug for being in charge of the end of your life. I think it's a great gift to your family. This is a personal opinion again. How do you I, spell pulsed? Is it P-U-L-S-T? P-O-L-S-T, and it stands for Physician's Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. And it's you have to have it signed by your doctor. Okay. And you get it from your doctor, actually. Um, oh, so just, I think using the choices that you have in order to manage your dying and your death can not only be a gift to yourself, but I regard it as a gift to my children that number one, I'm, I'm sort of brave enough, you know, to talk about my dying, to talk about it with them. It, it demystifies it. It's like, Oh, mom's going to die. Yeah. Well, she's told us how she feels about that. And, you know, it, it kind of takes the sting off of it. And um, I, you know, many of us, of course, are going to die very quick, you know, on the 18th hole and just, you know, are going up in a puff of smoke, like, like we always imagine. But I don't think from the people that I know, I don't think that actually happens very often. So thinking about with your advanced healthcare directive, for instance, you can say, you can list if you're if your advanced care directive does not list all your choices about treatments, you can write an addendum and put it on there. Do you want to have an NG tube down into your stomach to be fed artificially? Do you want to have kidney dialysis, which you know can or cannot be a really debilitating kind of treatment? Um, do you want to do chemo? Uh, or under what circumstances would you be willing to do chemo? You can think about all of those kinds of things, all of those kinds of treatments and just say yes or no on them. So it can be very, 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 very specific. Barbara? Uh, yeah. Can I go back to the post for just a minute? Sure. Um, you said that when she went in for her colonoscopy, the pulse would have kept her from being resuscitated, but I thought the pulse was only at home. Well, yeah, it is, but it's, it's also registered with your doctor's office because your doctor's given it to you, I guess, is the rate. Anyway, you see what I'm saying? It comes from your doctor. Yeah. Also, okay, so here. I guess that we need, if I'm Kaiser, so I guess I need to check with Kaiser to see how far it goes. If it goes yeah. outside of my house, then that's a problem. Yeah, well, if you're Kaiser, for sure it would go outside of your house because Kaiser has, your, has that record. Also, mm -hmm. the post is not valid until it is signed by a doctor. Mine is signed. Okay, so then it is valid. But if you, have, if, if you have any procedure like a colonoscopy or something uh, else that's relatively minor, you, you have to sign a new form that says you want to be resuscitated and, and then, or they won't do it because there is always a little bit of risk involved in that and they wanna be sure that they can resuscitate you if necessary. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And my other consideration is that what if something minor happens to you at home, but like I had a, a pneumonia and it scared me. I was, it was in the middle of the night and I just had some symptoms I'd never had before because I've been generally a pretty well person. And I, so I called 911 and they actually admitted me to treat a, a pneumonia that had been getting going 
I got it on a trip and it just kept getting worse. Um, so of course I would want to recover from the pneumonia, but I wonder what would have happened had I had 911 come and seen the post uh, mm -hmm. on my on my fridge. It's like, I'm, it's okay. I don't, you know, I'll probably not die from pneumonia, but I don't want to be let die because I have the wrong orders in place. Maybe some more questions, Marty. Yeah, thanks. That, thank you. I'm going to chat with my doctor. Um, I also have, um, I have a, sort of a handout that I want to send to you all. It's uh, tip, tips on, on grieving that I wrote and um, I'll send to you all. Um, also, let's talk more about the topic that Janice brought up. How do you be with family or friends who are dying? Now, Janice, who asked the question originally, has some good ideas about that. Janice. Well, uh, okay, I'm here. <laughs> um, I struggle with my friends that I shared with you. For those who weren't here, it's a couple that I've known for about 35 years and they're both dying at the same time. Oh. And um, I'm super close to them. They're, they're just very, very, very special people. And um, I found myself having a hard time uh, accepting that they're dying. And, and it was hard for me to reach out to them and, you know, like call frequently and stuff. I do see them in, we're in a group together and I do see them in the group. And I managed to call about once a month and, and was feeling guilty because um, I felt like I should be there more, but I just was struggling with it. So that- and then, and then what? Well, I've, you know, I, I, I wrote notes, uh, we write, we write in our group and I wrote notes about them and how much I, I am struggling with them being gone. And it's just really so hard. And all I wanted to do was hug them and saying things like that to them. And, uh, and I'm really, really trying to call them more often. And I think what Janice is talking about is, is something that's really common that, we are afraid of death, especially in this culture where death often is kind of compartmentalized away from us. And uh, we, don't, we don't see death as much as people in other cultures do. In other cultures, it happens right in the middle of the community and the children are there and the, and the neighbors are there and the family is there and they've seen it many times in their lifetime. I think it's different from that, you know, from that in, in America. And I think it makes us more afraid of death than people tend to be in other, in other cultures. So I think we can all be aware of that in ourselves. Janice also related that with another friend she has who's dying, she's been on the phone with her and they've been laughing and talking about ordinary things. Well, that's and just a couple, yeah. Oh, it was with them. Yeah. So I think that is, is huge to be able to just kind of carry on the friendship and ignore, but also acknowledge. And if it's not comfortable to acknowledge in person, acknowledge in a card, in a note, um, or ask Judy, you've been thinking about this. What did you come up with? Well, I, um, I feel like since I, since Lois and I started uh, Carquinas Village, I've been in some sense studying aging. And my latest focus on this is death, is starting to study death. And I'm taking a course from a group in Colorado called, called, what's it called? Hold on just a minute. The Conscious Dying Institute. And I was thinking, John, uh, when you were saying initially, you know, you're going to die and, you know, you don't have any choice and so on. Well, this is about urging people to have a plan 
Now, obviously, as Barbara said, medically, we can't determine how we're going to die. But I just heard recently that the most common way of dying in an increasing way is by frailty, so that you would, it wouldn't be an abrupt death, that you would have some time, possibly with your family and friends. So they're encouraging at the Conscious Dying Institute, they said, all of us will die, but only 20% 20 20 of people have a plan around their dying. So that's what partially what the course is about. The course is called Best Life, Best Death. So it's partly, you start out looking at, are you living your life according to the, your values as much as possible? If not, then try to shift gears so that you are. And then um, the last, our last assignment, we have to present a plan for if possible, if, you know, I was dying in a bed and I was going to have some time that I could choose what I was going to do. So that's what we have to present um, on the, at the last session that, uh, about how we are going to die. And here are some examples. Let me just see. Uh, so it's, there's not a right or wrong. It's um, everyone doing it their own way. Um, let me read off some of the examples they give. Uh, let's see. Hold on just a minute. Well, I'm not doing real well. Conscious dying. Oh, they, I didn't know about this. I'm sure that those of you in the medical field, Barbara and others, uh, knew about this, that there are end-of-life doulas and coaches who can help coach you through your last time and with what you've set up that you want. And they remain, you know, not central to your, if you have your family together, they're kind of behind the scenes. Um, so it could be that I had to laugh. One of their examples of someone who said well, how we wanted to die was if there was any kind of sports team going on, he wanted to die with that team and all his family members around. Um, oh. That just gives you one idea that it, you know, the choices are many, you know, it could be simple that you want certain kind of music played and you'd like your certain family members around. Uh, so anyway, that's one of the things that I'm working on uh, to be able to um, present and think about uh, what is it that I want? And I must say, after I attended this first class, uh, I felt like, like as though my thoughts and feelings about death were transformed into thinking about the possibilities that I could create a pleasant death as much as possible. I hadn't considered that. I was just kind of passive about, well, however it goes, it goes. And I was thinking I'm the last member of my nuclear family. My father died when I was 21. My sister died in 2004 and my mother died in 2008. My mother lived to 103, by the way. Um, but I, I look back on that and think I, think, I wish I'd been more thoughtful about how to be with them at the end of their life when they were dying. You know, I think my general attitude was to try to be um, have something interesting to say <laughs> or to be there for them. But I was thinking about it. Gosh, my mother, when she, she died at 103, if I thought about it, I would have jumped in her bed with her and, and, and cradled her for some time. I didn't think about anything like that. I didn't think about planning anything around death. So that's been quite significant to me just in taking this course and thinking, oh, well, I'm going to I'm going to be prepared. And just as Barbara was saying, I think that if I write something out and put it in my end of life file, um, I will be doing a service to my children that they can know that I had an idea of if I do have that possibility of some time um, that I could, um, that I had some idea of what I wanted to happen. Let me just see if I can find one of the pages in here. And honored them by telling them about it. <laughs> That's included right. them by telling them. Yeah. Oh, I was looking for the definition. A conscious death is defined and guided by the wishes, choices, and life-fulfilling priorities of the person who is dying and or the family members who are assisting in that way. Uh, yeah. 
Let me just see if there's anything else here that I thought would be of interest. No, I guess that's all. Um, but in the course, we we do different things, and I I feel like I'm getting acquainted with death. And one of the things they say in their material, everyone ought, would be better served if they made an effort to become acquainted with death before they're dying. Uh, and I, it's really making a difference for me. Um, you know, Judy, there's another, there's a, another outfit called the Conversation Project oh, yeah. and they have what's called the Five Wishes. And many people find them very, very useful. Yes. And mm -hmm. also Atul Gawande's Being Mortal. Atul Gawande is a doctor who's written a book called Being Mortal. That was one of the first books recommended by the Carquinas Village. Yes. And if you haven't read oh, it, great. I'm glad to share it with you. I've got a copy and um, I'd be happy because it's really well <laughs> worth it. Uh, and the conversation project, we sent that out, or I sent that out to everyone oh, a week or so ago. I did this with my youngest daughter, and we went through the whole conversation project, and it's raising questions that you may not have thought to raise or have a discussion with whoever it is that you would choose to have a discussion with. Um, and uh, so I did it with my daughter, Pam, who's in the healthcare field, and then I copied it and shared it with my other two children so that they all have. And it, it's talking about generally the kinds of things that are important to me in, in healthcare. And it certainly is similar. It covers some same ground as the um, advanced directive. By the way, I wanted to ask, I read in some of my reading recently that there is an additional advanced directive now specifically for dementia. Has anyone heard of that? I'm going to go see if I can find out. I'll go to the hospital. Cynthia, did you have some? Uh, I just will, could you say the name of the book one more time so I can write it down? The Being book Mortal. Being Mortal. Oh, thank you. Okay. I yeah. can loan it to you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But you can't have it. <laughs> Maybe you want it. Um, there's just one thing, uh, two things I wanted to share. One is what part of the issue with my friend dying is a sense of loss. Mm. And, you know, like I have old ab abandonment issues from childhood and all that stuff, but it's a sense of feeling abandoned and law losing a good friend. And it, you know, it doesn't make sense. I mean, it's not their fault that they're dying, but it still feels yeah. like, how can you leave me? How can you die? You know, I mm -hmm. want to just hug you, just stay here. So that, yeah. that, uh, that's something that, you know, goes through my mind. And the second thing was, I remember my mother dying and God, I wish I had these conversations because she, she was in the hospital and she was dying. She had a very, very bad heart. And, um, she called us. I was, this is Nilly. I, flo I flew down to be with my dad and my mom. And um, she called and we were at home, dad and I. And she said, you know, I want, I want to die. I want to go. And so we went to the hospital and we talked about it. And she, she was sure. And her doctor said, I'll never forget this. Every moment is precious. Oh. You never do that. Mm. And now listening to this, I thought, oh, my God, I could have gotten another doctor. Yeah, that's why you don't want to die in a hospital. If you want to die, you know, you need to leave the hospital. Yeah, she did. They, they sent her home on uh, Thursday night. She died Friday. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But so that that's, <clears throat> you know, I think it, there is a sense of loss when our it's a huge sense of loss. Just die. Yeah. And Janice, you know, you can do talk to people without having them there. Oh, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I talk to my mother a lot and you can yeah. talk to your friends, just <laughs> not with them there, yeah. you know, and just yeah. like say it all and repeat it and say it and cry and be angry. And part of the process of grieving. 
Yeah. Right. That's good, yes. Barbara. That's a yeah. good point. Yeah, I, I talk to my I'll... mom a lot. <laughs> I wonder yeah. if I could tell you about my sister. Um, she, my sister had millions of friends. She just was um, so fantastic. And she was a great friend and a wonderful sister. And she was dying of uh, ovarian cancer. And um, she said, okay. And she knew everything, never complained about all her treatment and whatnot. She, um, we were born and raised Catholics and we had final rights and all that sort of thing. But she said, I want to say goodbye to everybody. And so um, she had a list, you know, I, I was her secretary. So I, she had a list of everybody she wanted to see. And there were about oh, 35, 36 people. Wow. And she said, well, you know, invite everybody over. I said, no, no, you're not, you're not strong <laughs> enough for that. So I scheduled everybody. I mean, I'm very process oriented. So I scheduled everybody to come. And um, when the last person on the list came, um, probably a couple hours after that, she said, I have to go lie down. And of course she never got up again. She died about three days later, but it was just her, her, her desire to, um, put everyone at ease and wish them well and be sent, you know, and she was ready to go. And uh, I was with her for all the moments uh, at the end, reading to her and praying the rosary and all. <laughs> I don't know if she cared about that so much, but anyway, <laughs> or me, <laughs> but anyway, it was one of the things that I learned from a, a former teacher, Benedictine nun who did hospice work. And when my father was dying, she said, now is the time of greatest love. You really can only really abide with them and they with you. And so um, my sister set the mark for me. That's what I can say. Well, that's you know, lovely. Constance. Constance, you're reminding me about one of my fav favorite Compassion and Choices clients. She's a lady who lived in Rossmore and she'd been battling cancer for a long time. And she got hospice, she got <coughs> Compassion and Choices involved. And so I and another woman were selected to be her volunteers. And so, um, so she was going to, you know, use the medication and she got in touch with us and she said, is Saturday okay? Can you come over on Saturday? And we said, yes. So it's in the book. So what she did unbeknownst to us was she had, I think she was having a birthday and she had a birthday party on Friday with all of her friends and they had a grand party. She didn't tell them she was going as far as they knew she was celebrating her birthday. And so, you know, she, I guess was feeling well enough to go through that. And then the next day we came and she took the medication and she died. And, uh -huh. I and so I say, I have said to people for years, have your have your memorial service while you're still alive you know yes. i mean why wait or send flowers while someone's dying who's still alive don't send them to the funeral they don't know about them there you know i i, I think that a lot of the ritual that we have after the person has died is misplaced <laughs> Barbara, I just want to say say again and to Judy that, that the whole seminar series has just been phenomenal. Um, oh, and Barbara, just the care and compassion, you know, and the, in, the informative information is just uh, so well worth it. And the last assignment I had as active duty in the Air Force, which was during the Vietnam War, was casualty assistance. Ooh. And I wish I knew a little bit of what we have now uh, when I was 25 years old. Yeah. So yeah. thanks everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone else have any any uh, suggestions of what something you've done? Because it's really helpful um, to hear Barbara's comment and uh, Con Constance comment about things. And yes, Cynthia? I think I'm unmuted. Um, I was, um, I was able to work with both of my parents that in a way that allowed them to die at home. But for those of you who don't know me, I'm a registered nurse. And um, it really, uh, my father died, at, he, had, he was in hospice and, and we knew 
this was going to be going on. And when I was called to the bedside, he was, you know, I could tell he was pretty close to the end. And I called my brothers and everybody rallied around and we sat in his, my father's bedroom and for hours. And we just, the siblings talking with my mother and just talking, talking, talking. And my father just sort of slowly uh, went to where we go and we were all there. And I was, I, um, as a nurse, you know, we recognized certain things and I told my family, okay, dad's about to go. So everybody say goodbye. And we all went, hello, goodbye, farewell, safe journey. And, you know, we love you. And it was, um, it does, that sort of experience does so much to help mitigate the sense of grief and the loss and, we felt the rest of the family, we felt so bonded and we were so glad to have been there and working together. And it, it's really, it's, it's hard to do, but it's really worth the satisfaction when you're done, I have to say. And then my mother was, I brought my mother home to live with me towards the end and she um, just abruptly died. But again, we were around her, we were watching the election results on one November 2nd, years, 10 years ago. <laughs> Um, not the recent elections, but, um, and again, because we were there, the family was there because they were, they came back to Benicia to vote and we were all around and it's just a really marvelous way to send your loved ones off when you can be there. So I, I, um, I've, I've attended a number of deaths and if anybody needs that kind of help and support, you can call me. I'd be glad to work with you as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. You know, Judy, Kate. yes, oh, it's such a relief to be in a group like this and hear discussions of this import for everybody without a lot of a lot of um, mystery or or fear. It's just beautiful to hear you all talk, and I feel comfortable hearing it, and I feel comfortable with the fact that we can discuss this kind of stuff. It's just really wonderful. That's great. Well, you know, when I knew that this was going to be a part of it, I knew right away I wanted to ask Barbara to come to lead the session because when she talked to with us a few years ago, I thought, oh my God, this person can talk about death like she'd talk <laughs> about, you know, getting a candy bar at the store. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so I think, thank you, Barbara, you've set the tone because of your comfort. And I, I, I so thank Compassion and Choices for, for putting me in that space because, and, and being able to, to, to witness death. I, my mother died when I was 11 and I was not allowed to go to the funeral. I was not allowed. I oh. wanted to, I wanted to contribute you know, and I wasn't even allowed to go to the funeral much. And I wasn't allowed to even contribute any ideas. Oh, and it, it was like grief stuck in my throat yeah. for, you know, like 40 years. I, uh, yeah. So uh, Compassion and Choices, again, the website, Compassion and Choices, all one word, dot org can take you through, you know, as far as you can, as far as you can, uh, a person, by the way, who is not quite completely out of it with Alzheimer's or dementia can fill out an, an advanced healthcare form. They kind of go in and out of the dementia at first. So as was suggested to me by an Alzheimer's support group, family members said, catch them on a good day. Uh, <laughs> and again, to be, you know, to, you can talk with them about all the specifics. <clears throat> do you ever want this? Do you ever want that? Because if you don't do it at the end, you know, you're saying, oh, mom never would have wanted to be yeah. in this position. I, I heard, a, I got a, I heard a quote today that I, I want to share. Life is a blessing to, t to die fulfilled an even greater one. Isn't that lovely? It is lovely. Well, I'm watching the clock, and I think it is, it is time. Molly, Loa, Loa, raised, Loa raised her hand. Julie. Oh, I, I was just going to share something. It, it wasn't um, um, end of life at old age. Um, I had a grandson who was diagnosed with osteosarcoma when he was 10, 
And um, he died when he was 14. And I, I was able to stay in contact with him. Um, they lived in Texas and they were in constant treatments. Um, they would drive from the border of Texas to Houston twice a week. Wow. And so I was unable to see him most of the time until it was near his death. And so I was able to be with him and, and someone mentioned this wanting to get into bed and, and hug them. And I was able to do that. And I was able to hold him when he was uh, experiencing uh, procedures in his room. And, wow. and I knew I was grieving all along because I knew that it was a very aggressive cancer mm. and, and that we weren't gonna have him very long. And so when I, his mother did not want him to know he was dying. So I couldn't cry in front of him, but <clears throat> I kind of felt like it brought out my best self because I was just loving and caring. And I just, you know, just poured it over him while I could. Beautiful. And so <clears throat> eventually um, they did release him at home and he died very shortly after that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For the, other, the other group that really knows how to face death are the veterinarians. When yeah. you have to have a pet put down in your arms, oh. they're so good. They're wonderful. And yes, just like you said, you, you pour love all over them and then they're gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so, Mar Marty, uh, yesterday, who was it brought up? Um, oh, in a discussion group. Um, oh, was it Molly? Lap of Love is apparently a national organization that you're familiar with those, them that, that they send uh, vets to your home who will euthanize your pet and, and you'll be able to let them die in your arms like Marty said. I had, I, I've had two schnauzers. One, I, the regular vet came to the house and put her down when she was in my arms. And then last September, I went to Sage, a, a veterinarian in Concord, and they brought my dog in. And I had 30 minutes with her. I could have taken longer if I needed to and loved her. And then the vet came in and very nicely got below her eyesight and she died in my arms. And oh, it was lovely. very compassionate. Mm. And so I, I kind of laughed and half seriously said, I want to go to the vet to die. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you learned today that you don't have to, Marty. <laughs> That's great. Molly, yeah. thank you for recording. Barbara, thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for your contributions. Um, I agree with, with Mimi. It's to sit and talk about death and as we have it, is a gift yeah. from everyone. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. So next week is the uh, funeral funeral parlor oh. uh, presentation. Okay. Okay.